people who are not part of the Young Curators Academy, but most people are part of the Young Curators Academy. Um, so I would uh, just say where uh, the Young Curators Academy is this platform during the HAP Salon where we invited 33 international young curators from all over the world and for 10 days we're um, sharing works that we're doing in our context. We're having different workshops, lectures, um, discussions and we had already two sundowners um, the last two days and today we're so happy that Kang Seng is um, sharing with us um, actually a part of his PhD <laughs> but we'll hear about this later so let me introduce to you this wonderful inspiring colleague that I met this year so uh, Ong Kang Seng um, and I have to read the list because it's so long of all the amazing projects that he did. So he's a director, but um, also an initiator of so many platform spaces projects that um, most of them are still running. So um, you uh, are the director of Theatre Works and of Art Space uh, 7213 in Singapore, as well as the founding director of the Singapore International Festival of the Arts. And the initiator and director of um, Arts Network Asia, of the Curators Academy in Singapore, and um, of the Flying Circus Project, the residency program that Kang Seng will tell us about more tonight. And the, this is also a part of his recently finished PhD <laughs> called Creating Nothing. <laughs> at uh, New York University. So we are really excited to obviously have you here in Gorky and to hear more about um, the amazing work. And we, Kang Seng will give a lecture and afterwards there will be obviously the possibility to ask questions. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. Hi, 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 hi. Okay, um, you know, I, 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 I'm so happy that this is, uh, I managed to cut it down to 65 pages of reference because it's a 500 over pages opus. Every time I print, I kill one tree, which is really like, it's really horrible. But, uh, you know, I'm one of those that can't read it on the screen because after a while I need to correct and, yeah. So anyway, but I, um, I suppose um, uh, to cut into the, into the material because it's long and um, um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to kind of shorten it too much, you know. But one thing is that actually, to the, these last few days with the Young Curators Academy, we've been talking about um, uh, language, right? So I tried to, and of course, this trauma of like, oh my God, there's too much English, too many big words. So I tried to simplify, and uh, please forgive me if I didn't simplify enough. Um, okay, so I'm talking about this project. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to bring you through a kind of nomadic residency of three different editions, which was in 2007, 2010, and 2013. And um, um, it's a it's a project which, in retrospect, when I wrote the PhD, I called it creating nothing. And um, the sense that what's happening as we are um, growing as artists in those years, the art market was also rising tremendously to the point where the art market actually um, kind of, I would say, uh, almost uh, suffocated everyone who was in it, um, even though uh, it was it was also a, a big profit for many people who profited off the tours and profited meaning that they, they could continue to make work, right? Because basically, there's nothing to be earned. You're just making work and you tour and it's a subsistence for you. Um, and this is in performance. I'm not talking about visual arts because there are also many visual artists who participated. And this, this, um, this project is a nomadic artist residency and it was focused on transforming the artist or what I would call it now in the frame of this um, festival, it was about de the artist. Because I think that we, we very much talk about de society and public policy, but very often um, we, the artists, the cultural workers, are also um, 
needing to be decolonized because we are extremely colonial also in our various methodologies and in our interactions and you know and i suppose it's it's um, it's something which which is so central. That's why I, I prefer to use the term intercultural rather than transcultural or or crosscultural because the history of this term intercultural really became uh, um, in vogue, so to speak, around the 80s with Peter Brook's Mahabharata, where it was very much debated, extremely critiqued that this white in inverted commas made in the made for for international tour. UK director, um, a, a, an important director, but he worked with uh, Indian artists and basically the whole idea of kind of colonizing the Mahabharata. And it, it was also seen to be owned by many Indians and, uh, from, uh, and the South uh, Asian continent. And I think that it was a very important moment where intercultural, the word, became almost like it was colonizing it was about appropriation so i feel like this this term inter uh, intercultural is itself very very controversial and i want to use it mainly as a kind of to retrieve it but also to in a way constantly remind us that the decolonization project is continuous we are needing to constantly um, be vigilant to ourselves and be vigilant to our processes. So anyway, so this idea of dehymatizing the artist, and it was uh, it was about bringing artists mostly, I would say, like um, into a context where they were traveling, and hence they were meeting different different contexts, and hence they had to let go of their comfort zones and let go of um, their frames to to actively engage with other frames. So, um, and I, I would say like, like uh, in 2004, there was a very seminal meeting where it was a kind of meeting of artists all in Singapore. There were maybe 50, 60 artists for one month. We were there together. And we, we came to the conclusion that at the end, or, or, or I felt from the conclusion that we need to get out of the black box and we need to get out of the white cube that we need to travel. And the idea of as the artists traveling and um, thinking as a physical act. And this is what's performative about the whole project because we are, we are thinking as we travel, as we actively take uh, planes, ships, Rail, uh, railroad, different different ways, walking, cycling, and this idea of um, that thinking is not just in words, ideas, and concepts, but that it's it's it, it's itself a physical act. We have to use the body. We have to use the body, our bodies, to encounter the others. And um, the first iteration in this way was the Vietnam version, where we traveled to Vietnam. So I'm going to put this on behind me. I hope it doesn't get you all too distracted because my, my speech has nothing, my talk has nothing to do with the images. I mean, it is, it is about us going through um, uh, the journey in Vietnam and Singapore. This is 2007. And I think that it gives you a sense of the kind of play that was working and actually the fact that we were, we were playing and not being productive as a whole kind of a critique of, uh, of the capitalist, capitalist system. And of course, we, it was a very expensive venture, but it was also a kind of a venture to, to talk about that this is necessary. It's not luxury for artists, but it's about taking care and bringing them into a very political context where they have to decide what does it mean to be traveling through um, a, a city after the Vietnam War? How do we deal with this part of history and how do we deal with uh, solidarities, forming a cosmopolitan society. Uh, many of the things which we are talking about now, so that in a sense the Flying Circus and the Young Curators Academy are almost like, um, um, well, the Flying Circus ended in 2013 and I, began, and I began the Curators Academy in 2018 in Singapore. And I like to believe that they are actually a continuous fabric and um, a sense of how from dehymatizing the artist, we now have to dehymatize the 
curator because the curators are gatekeepers and they are the ones who actually determine very much what actually is being presented in our institutions. And um, uh, so this idea of, of um, the Vietnam version as a kind of a travel log and that we are thinking and questioning as we are traveling. So traveling as physical thinking that we open up our senses, we encounter other levels of awareness rather than being inside a kind of a deadlock of the rehearsal room or the deadlock of the gallery or the deadlock of the theatre. So it was also a kind of a proposal that actually art research um, equals art practice or research equals practice, meaning that they are not two separate things. Research is not processed to get a product, but actually research is the work itself. Research is the practice itself. And that's why you can see that this, in the end, um, my whole proposition is that we were creating nothing. We were wasting money and we were, in a sense, but I, I, I think I need to give a clarification of where this money came from, right? Because it came from uh, a, a lot from uh, mostly foundations, so um, American foundations who actually uh, owe a debt to what they have done in Vietnam. And um, uh, yes, and this money was, uh, was then put back into a proposition uh, with international artists visiting, but also local artists. And I, I, I think what, what was interesting to see over the, uh, maybe the decade, was how the international artist group transformed. Because in 2007, we were very much, um, we were self-absorbed, I would say. We were involved in playing and in destroying capital. And in 2010, in, in um, Cambodia, we became very involved in this idea of uh, small actions and the, set, uh, the need to take agency. What does it mean to take agency and the whole question of ethical generosity? How do we become generous? Uh, uh, to, towards each other in an ethical way. And this agency was then something where we interacted very much with, uh, with uh, the local artist community. And in fact, we created a kind of what I called the alternative university, where you know, the idea of altering each other, it was called alter you, could, which could mean alter university, alternative university, or altering each other. Right? So it was just simply all to you, and that was in uh, Cambodia. So this sense of right, from, from the playing and just destroying capital, we started to take on agency to think about how we can uh, make a, a small political difference and to take on small actions. And the last in, in Myanmar in 2013 was very interesting because um, we went there like half a year after Aung San Suu Kyi was in power and uh, or was, she was in the, in the parliament, but it's a very complicated situation because she was actually allowed to be in the parliament because it was the military realizing that um, there was no way that the dictatorship could continue. So the military then created a democracy. So this is a, a kind of situation where we see the, the invisible politics uh, behind the wall or behind, uh, um, uh, because of course, I think the fall of the wall here has also many uh, political implications from what was happening between Russia and America and you know, this whole, what Gorbachev was doing and, and uh, what was happening also in the US. And um, uh, so that, that every moment when a dictatorship falls, we have to question what's behind that fall. And what, for me anyway, I feel that it's very important that, of course, the people power uh, plays a strong part, but actually, ironically, um, in Myanmar, because a couple of years before the, um, um, the, the transformation into a democracy, there was the Saffron Revolution with the monks marching. And that was very cruelly uh, brought down. And these revolutions were actually very much uh, controlled by the military. The military was still in power, but the decision to let go and hence the suspiciousness of this uh, transformation is that um, it's not completely dehymatized, right? This democracy in Myanmar is still very much run by the military. And um, 
So, but 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 that that was just, that's a kind of detour. But we arrived half a year after Aung San Suu Kyi, which uh, the, 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 the 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 locals call her the lady. The lady came into the parliament, and she brought uh, 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 by popular by public vote, uh, she brought about maybe fifty people from her party into a larger parliament of six hundred. So it it was really a small, very small fraction, and. Um, uh, but we arrived, we had prepared for the flying circus for three years. So we were making all these elaborate plans of going underground. And suddenly, it was all above board. No more censorship. So I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, so we had to really rethink the whole thing, like six months before. And this was a, a, a very interesting time, that this whole sense of like, how do you deal with a complete... Uh, what they call a game changer, so that it was a democracy suddenly, right on the on the surface. So I I think that um, the 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 interesting thing about this project was that very often we had to, um, as curators, as researchers, as producers, as organizers, we had to prepare the ground. And I think this is one of the ethics of the work, which is that how do we prepare the ground locally, right? We can't just arrive like some UFO. And so in, 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 in practice, it normally takes about two years of working on the ground to activate uh, the, um, the local NGOs, the local artists, and the local um, uh, also dissidents, because some of the work was very, uh, was very, very po political. And um, I think that the Flying Circus in general fell outside the frame of the art market, right? Because we were, the practice there of the Flying Circus was talking, listening, thinking, questioning, researching. So useless, all useless in inverted commas in a market economy and at best viewed ambivalently. So the processes were very um, um, also contradictory, sometimes very directionless, because it was like a rhizome, meaning that there was no particular direction. So part of the dehymatizing was also to dehymatize a, a, a leader uh, and to let the, the space become a space for these um, 30, or 30 plus artists to take their own directions. And I think that, that it was very interesting because as I was planning this, you know, I, 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 I think that when, when we were inviting artists, I think the most extreme entang entanglement of the market, this is a nice anecdote, was an artist's request to bring his ensemble of four dancers to rehearse in Vietnam while he participated in the Flying Circus. The Flying Circus would have to provide accommodation for his ensemble and also rehearsal space for them. He would need four hours to work each day with his company and they might use the Vietnamese experience in a new show. So I declined this proposal because the Flying Circus was attempting to decolonize itself from the art market. So it was a, it was a very kind of interesting situation because the whole idea of how do we dehymatize ourselves as a as a group because i think that that we we can no longer uh, deny our complicity in the um, in in the political situation and how do we interrogate that so you know the financial terms it's it's very uh, much similar to what um happened here with the Young Curators Academy. There's a very small fee, there's travel, there's visa fees, there's hotels, there's per diems. And, um, but what's interesting is that actually what we're asking from these kind of quite well-known artists, because at that time we felt like to dehymatize this art market, we had to work with people who were in the market. And uh, it was a lot to ask them to come for two weeks where they were doing nothing. And because we were also taking them away from their families, and they knew that this was not downtime. You cannot really relax. It's, it's work and not work. It's play and not not play. It was something kind of strange. It was in, in between all these, uh, these different spaces. So... You know, I've been introducing some terms and I want to continue with this idea of the terms which I have uh, talked about with the Young Curators Academy. One is the idea of a synapse. And the synapse is the junction between two nerve cells. So the, 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 the nerve cells are, are grow, growing and they don't 
touch, right? They don't touch, but they, they are, they're just like this, and there's a space here. And there are many nerves coming here, and there's a space, and this is a synapse. This is the synapse or the junction, okay? The junction between two nerve cells or more nerve cells. And it's a very small space, but they don't actually connect. And I think this is what happens when we make an academy or a laboratory or a, a workshop. Uh, these, all, all the participants are like nerve cells which don't really connect, but we, we open into a common space. And it's a kind of a minute gap but the, the nerves are sending something, a message. It empties it into the synapse and it crosses to another nerve. And, uh, and there's some kind of translation happening across the space. So, so what happens at the synapse? So the, 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 at the synapse, scientifically, there is a neurotransmitter. What's a neurotransmitter? It's a chemical substance which is released at the end of a nerve fiber by the arrival of a nerve impulse. So the nerve impulse is released into the space. It's, a, it's together with the neurotransmitter, like a chemical substance, and it diffuses across the, the, the small gap, and it affects and affects the transfer of the impulse to the other nerve fiber or muscle fiber or some other structure. So I think this is what we are, we are doing in these kinds of spaces. We are, in a way, in a kind of a, a synapse where we affect each other because these nerve impulses are being passed into the space and they are, they are being um, uh, um, kind of diffused or translated across. So I, I, I would like to say, like, this idea of translation is quite an important process because in these, in these cities that we were in, like Vietnam, we were working primarily in Vietnamese or in Cambodia in Cambodian and in Myanmar in uh, Burmese. Um, and that um, uh, what actually is happening in the process of translation? And I just want to read here a little bit that translation is a human process, was a human process for, for, uh, for the flying circus with volunteers. And this was part of the preparation of the site, that we would go into the site and we would uh, try to discover with our local partners groups of uh, very um, hardworking, outgoing, bright undergraduates or, or, or postgraduates. So we didn't look at translation like a UN conference where simultaneous professional translation aims for a perfect substitution or exchange of language, but instead the communication process was much more, um, was much more about effects. It was much more about translators becoming friends. There were a lot of outside situations because the translators would bring uh, the participants to markets to and sometimes even to their homes to schools to different areas so there were lots of human connections friendships and initiation rights to different groups in the city and uh, many visits that, so that it was like normally we would only work half the day and the other half day was uh, was open to the translators bringing and being kind of friends in a bit of commerce and being the bridge, being the mediators in the city itself. So the idea was to try to bring artists into a, into a reality and not stay in the rehearsal room. Um, and the translators were not neutral machines. They were actually another layer in the process. They had to be accounted for, they had to be negotiated, and um, it was this effective process that we are, we are in, right? Which I think that in every kind of academy, there is an effective process. It's not just a university bureaucracy. And I know many artists who have worked in university bureaucracies who actually say no, that, the, that the, these spaces have become no longer spaces of effect. They are just rules and they are just uh, regulations which are controlling the space. So, um, so for example, my, my, my translator, you know, she, she's now a, a young curator that some of you met in Singapore. Uh, I, I, I didn't keep in touch with her for 10 years and then one day she applied in an open call to the Young Curators Academy in Singapore. And, and at that time, she was 
quite young, she was early 20s, and she spoke perfect English, and this was her ambition. She, said, she told me born, she was born after the war, and she wanted to translate post-structural philosophy books into Vietnamese when she graduated. So she was working on Derrida, Foucault, Butler, and, um, and I think that when you, when you speak to the translator and we are conversing in English and she's saying that, you immediately understand her, her, her individual ambition, drive, and also that, that the context that her translations came from. So, you know, as a kind of ongoing legacy of the Flying Circus and the potentiality of the Flying Circus, even why I'm here now in Berlin, uh, invited by Sherman, is that I feel like um, I try to move out of stabilities due to the fact uh, that I think stabilities become actually a way in which the market is reinforced. So I constantly try to move away from the market, move away from the stability of Singapore, and not to be, uh, to be colonized by the very right-wing politics there. Um, as a constant reminder of uh, the potential of different art practices all over the world, and the fact that um, I feel like these photographs that I've shown you, they are, they are photographs by a, by a very interesting queer artist, Brian Gotong Tan, and he, he works with, um, uh, he kept all these photographs because he was not the official archivist, but his photographs re revealed the effective attachments in between uh, the flirtations between the participants, the banquets, all the food we were eating, labor on the streets, telephone lines, markers, flowers, fruits, animals. He loved cats, and every time you see cats, I, I took them out. So this is not a record, this is not a complete record. I had a thousand photographs, I just chose the more the photographs to give a narrative, uh, or, or my narrative, but because his narrative, the cats would be very important, it's, all, it's everywhere. Um, uh, flowers, fruits, animals, architecture, nature, environments, repose after mental exhaustion, because there was always, it was always full on, right? Um, like now in the academy as well. Um, uh, material common badges of uh, of consumerist uh, uh, fashion, um, and uh, uh, but the qu but uh, but I have uh, an academic answer to that, a theoretical answer to that, and that's uh, and that's from Jane Bennett. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so like airports, modes of travel. I mean, kind of like you know, like like very recently, you know, uh, it, uh, we've we've encountered artists speaking about how we should stop traveling, and I think that it's. Um, it's very well and fine to say that when we are in a very mature part of uh, our development, but sometimes for young artists, and they really need to travel. They need to see the world, they need to connect. And, um, and if we, we uh, refuse that connection, I think that the world can be very, can be in deep shit. I think that because we are not traveling and we're not going to places which uh, we need to engage with, uh, face to face, and um, I, I want to I want to quote from John Luke Nancy uh, in his book The Creation of the World or Globalization, and he says, "quote It is a question of owning up to the present. We must ask we must ask anew what the world needs of us and what we want of it, without the capital of the world, but with the richness of the world." And, and then at the same time, to balance that also with, well, I mean, uh, with, uh, with Aiwa Ong. She's a, she's a Malaysian uh, academic who's based in the US. And she talks about neoliberalism, um, how meetings like this can be very neoliberal because you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring uh, curators together or artists together. And that, that in a way, that becomes a new product. So I think that we need to also be vigilant about what does it mean when, when, when we bring artists together? Are we perpetuating the production cycle? Uh, uh, when we bring curators together, are we um, actually um, uh, uh, being part of this new, lab, new liberal capital where potential is also product, right? Um, so, 
jumping ahead, I, th I think that in, in Vietnam, this was a, there was a con continued reversal of value. I think this word value is very important for us to talk about that because I feel like, like here in, in the Gorky, for example, so much value is given to um, the human relationships and the, the, the biographies, the politics, because this is a very important part of our work. I mean, as a curator, I, I've met many curators who tell me that, you, that I don't curate according to biographies. It's just the work that I see. And I, I, I can agree with that, but I can also disagree with that. And I think that, th that there is a lot of value apart from the actual artwork that you see inside um, uh, the gallery or the theater as well. And um, in this case, the traveling be became the end in itself. There was no useful transaction because no work was made uh, directly. And, um, and the work also was, it was hard to make work about Vietnam, you know, it was not so, it's, it's a very, very complex situation and many of the artists knew that it was, uh, it was not going to be an, uh, a, a simple uh, space. Um, and uh, I think that this idea, again, um, uh, from Nancy, who is very influenced by Marx, the idea of the absolute value in itself, pure and simple, not a use value, not an exchange value. I think this is very important for us to reflect on that, that when we are in a situation like an academy or, or a lab or a, a, a workshop, are we, are we just looking at, at exchange? Are we looking at using each other? And how do we try to reduce that? I mean, it's impossible to, you know, but, but how do we actually try to transform our transactions so that they don't remain as transactions. So I, I, here I want to quote from an um, um, Indian-American, well, she's South Asian-American uh, um, academic, Anurima Banerjee. She has a, a concept called paratopia. And paratopia is, she calls it a space of performance which exists parallel or at the side of dominant culture, adjacent to dominant culture. It's, it's not referencing the dominant culture and it's sometimes critiquing it, sometimes independent of it, sometimes interdependent with it. So this idea of a kind of paratopia on the side, I feel that that was, that was very much the flying circus because we were not making something for the art market. And... Um, how can we oppose and how can we subvert the dominant culture by being at the side? Um, and, you know, this is, a, this is a, in, the, in the academy, we've been talking about lots of uh, different ways of resisting and uh, different ways of, is it, is it confrontational? Is it uh, negotiation? Is it some kind of other subversion? And, and I think Anurima uh, proposes something which is, which is interesting because she talks about, about lying adjacent by the side of the dominant culture. And um, uh, it's, it's something which I think is also about how to find, um, uh, uh, how to take care how to be, how to find enjoyment, how to find play. And uh, here now I, I go to an old, uh, crit uh, old writer, uh, a white male writer, but very important, Donald Winnicott, because uh, he proposed three areas of human living. You are living, you're inside yourself, outside, and you are in between. So this third space of the in between is when you are in play, all right? So that the, the child is very, and he's actually a, a child psychologist. He did not come from theater, but a lot of uh, people are uh, uh, um, theater professionals use or appropriate his ideas. And this idea of playing is, um, is a kind of a basic form of living, this third space where it's not inside or outside, but it's an in-between space. So I think the Flying Circus was this kind of in-between space where it was not the market, but we can also not deny that the market was close by, but we were in this uh, third space of playing. And it was a space of, uh, of some potential otherness. So, um,
can see already that I, I am jumping big sections. Okay, but um, so, so the whole question of intercultural exchange that we cannot, or inter intercultural um, uh, transactions or, um, or, or interfaces, they cannot escape history because it occurs in the aftermath of colonialism, right? So we are, we are all uh, products of colonial, colonialism, or uh, maybe ongoing products, and how do we, how do we engage with that? Um, so, after this flying circus, I think that, well, Many people felt that it was it was an interesting uh, um, uh, exercise of of kind of lying by lying on the side of capital, but the need to go a little bit more um, a little bit more beyond happened in Cambodia. The idea of how do we uh, search for agency and how do we engage, not just play and destroy capital because there's a limit to that, right? You can, you can bash up a, 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 a car, you can do certain things, to, we can do many things to, to comment and to, to, to express the empowerment, but it needs a little bit more as the next step. And so we were, we were spending money not our money, but money that belonged to us because it was, it was, it was a blood money. Uh, but it was, in a sense, also, um, it, 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 it needed to go to the next step. And this we did in Cambodia, um, where it was about these acts of um, ethical generosity and small actions. I think that's very important to once again uh, come back to that we, we should not be in a grand narrative always, Maybe we are unfortunate or fortunate enough to be in a grand narrative, but very often we are in the small actions of, uh, of making small differences of uh, commun community building, of human relationships. And in Cambodia, the enchantment there, and this word enchantment or magic, uh, which is itself, of course, a very... Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a controversial word. You know, I like, I like to retrieve controversial terms, uh, because it, it, it has a kind of ambivalence, a double meaning. But this enchantment of tourism, what happens when you are, and you are enchanted and you become generous in your tourism? And what happens when, when you actually discover effective attachments to the world? And I, I think that this, this for me was a very um, uh, interesting experiment. I, I, I think maybe 10 years ago, we were not so cynical, but I feel like, like now we really need enchantment. We really need to still feel that it's, uh, uh, it's important to, to, to look at things of beauty. It's important to look at things of goodness. It's important to look at, at also, of course, very complex issues. But there is a need to keep enchanted. And there is a reason for that. Because uh, as Jane Bennett says, and, and she's been a, a, this big... Well, it's a, it's a very readable book. She's been working on, on things like waste. Uh, um, she's, she's been working on waste, but, the, but this is an earlier book in 2001 where she talked about the politics of enchantment. How, if we are no longer enchanted, we will become cynical, and then um, everything is just released to politicians to do whatever they want. Right? So this idea of and when we were in Cambodia, it was a very interesting time because it was the time of the war crimes trials. It was 2010, and uh, we had uh, an alternative university there, and uh, the, the film and uh, journalism students, the visual arts uh, participants, um, uh, were actually going to the war crimes trials, and there was a kind of a constant reflection. And this idea of epic acts of reparation, when you are in this war crime trial that after 10 years uh, only convicted three people, right? So it's, uh, the others died, they were released, it's all sorts of different reasons, but only three convictions of a, of a civil war that killed millions of people. 
the, the numbers, of course, is always controversial, but definitely it's, it's uh, over one million people that were killed there for wearing spectacles, for speaking a foreign language. And, and in the end, after 10 years, this epic act of reparation by the, by, um, the UN and also by the local courts only convicted three people. I think they spent... I cannot have, I, it's in my 500 page opus, but it's not here. It's about, um, it's, it's in the hundreds of millions in the last 10 years. Um, and so what were we doing, the artists who were there, uh, uh, de ourselves? We were, we were involved in small, very, very small acts. We couldn't take on like big uh, kind of war crimes trials and epic acts of reparation. We, we did small personal uh, actions of working with uh, young students because it's also a, a situation where after many years of, of civil war, the universities have not bounced back. They are basically failed universities and we had to, comp we had to create an alternative artist university uh, uh, context. So this this whole chapter, I think, in Cambodia was about the affective turn. What happens when we go back to affect as, as a primary action of the work that we do? Not uh, making artworks, but, cr but generating effect. So we, we call it the affective turn, and, um, or, or theorists have called it that, and ethical generosity. And now I want to quote from Max Weber, because we, he's another white man that's there. But he says, the fate of our times is characterized by rationalization and intellectualization, and above all, by disenchantment of the world. So we went out to try to, to, try to enchant ourselves again in Phnom Penh and in, uh, in the Angkor Wat. And, um, and now, what is enchantment? Jane Bennett gives a, dis gives, gives a definition, and I think it's good to go to that. In uh, her book of 2001, it's called, for those who are interested, The Enchantment of Modern Life, Attachments, Crossings, Ethics. And she says, the overall effect of enchantment is a mood of fullness, planitude, liveliness, a sense of having one's nerves or circulation or concentration powers tuned up, recharged, a shot in the arm, a fleeting return to childlike excitement about life. So that's, that's her. There are many different uh, definitions of enchantment, but that, that's one which floats through the book. And I think that, that um, uh, she has a very interesting proposal, which I love, which is that you, you can be extremely consumerist, but you can also be uh, um, involved in uh, ethical generosity. And, uh, and uh, um, she talks about how, okay, she says this, which I think is very important, that effect is never predictable. It happens in all different directions, and she likens it to, to, um, to nanotechnology, where all these atoms are jumping around and it's shooting in different directions. And, uh, and I always like to give the example of Angelina Jolie in her Louis Vuitton bag in Angkor Wat. And, you know, and uh, uh, when you see the advertisement, we, we also realize that uh, Angela, uh, Angelina Jolie actually adopted several children from Cambodia after she went there to film, right? And at the same time, I think that it's very likely that maybe someone from the Midwest sees this beautiful advertisement of Angelina Jolie with the Louis Vuitton bag and Uncle Wat and says, okay, where's Cambodia? I, can't, I, I need to find this on the map. I need to go there. And they go there and maybe they start to donate $10,000 to a foundation. That's very possible. I, I've seen that happening a lot. And it's actually a lot of the, of the, of the work that's happening in um, Cambodia is from, uh, is from philanthropy, personal philanthropy. And I, I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's, it's not effective. But so Bennett wants, uh, Jane Bennett wants to animate pleasure to rescue ethical life. So for her, she's not a monk or a nun. She, she wants to animate pleasure to rescue ethical life. And she, she wants to harness consumerism, materialism, and commodification strategically. 
right? This is a very important work because I think that right now there are, there are many younger tourists, uh, tourists, <laughs> scholars who are working on stra strategic essentialism, for example. When are we strategically be, uh, uh, um, employing identity? When are we doing these things to actually uh, 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 force a change? Right, so so you know, uh, it, in my generation, we were we were much more um, skeptical of this kind of strategics or strategies. But scholars are looking at that now. That this idea of like, when are you strategically essentialist, and when are you harnessing consumerism, materialism, commodification? And she says that that we need to avoid cynicism. This is Bennett. Uh, cynicism that reduces expectations of the state and thus diminishes our will to respond collectively to injustices. So the sense that if we stop being enchanted with the world, we just give up. So we don't really work anymore to change anything. And, and I think that, that uh, you know, we, we talked about hope, optimism, uh, all these things. That they, they are different, different words, but I think that the sense of of uh, uh, in the academy that that I think that we're coming together, we are gathering because we are still hopeful. Uh, maybe not immediately uh, in the near run, very optimistic, but hopeful. That and this is the, this is the the way that we continue to enchant ourselves by meeting others, by engaging with others. So okay, now. Mm, I think that this is, is completely, you know, I, I, I propose this because it's, it's two different perspectives of, of, um, of um, responsibility and of world creating. Uh, John Luke Nancy proposes one, uh, kind of a, the, the, the white male perspective is that you, world, you create world by, by Marxism. You have, to, you have to go to the extreme. And then Jane Bennett creates something else where she says that enchantment can appropriate commodification. Can, we can, we, 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 it doesn't have to be black or white. It can be something more strategic. So, um, I think, and I think that this is, this is, this is really the, uh, about different politics and how uh, it's, it's two ge different generations, it's two different genders. Uh, the approach is completely different. So, um, maybe I, I jump to Myanmar, right? This time is really almost gone. Yeah, almost there. So, okay, that's 45 minutes. So now we... Um, and and, and uh, um, this idea of the flying circus being another time, another way of being, another zone, another ethic, which is to quote uh, Anurima's uh, Paratopia, that the international artist goes into a relationship where they are in dialogue with many Cambodian dancers, Cambodian visual artists, Cambodian filmmakers, and... Um, this idea of, uh, I, I wrote this email, which was 5th January 2010, to the artists to introduce them to what we were about to do. It was called After Peace, Post Rupture. But writing about the disconnect for the young Cambodian participants, the 20 somethings, and how they were disconnected because it was a war that they didn't um, experience. Um, and in a sense, they were all born after the war and how they are inheriting a very severed context, a very toxic context, which was not created by them. And how actually um, uh, many NGOs perceived need or urgency on a way which was actually irrelevant to the 20-somethings. So I find that quite interesting that it was, it was a discovery because, uh, because I had worked in Cambodia with, with many collaborators from there since the year 2000. So after 10 years of working there, it was suddenly this idea of like, how, how are uh, the 20-somethings, we talk about a future, but how are they really connecting to this future? Uh, that we, are, uh, we as NGOs or we as artists, as activists are creating for them 
and it's it, as you can see for them all these things is not with them it's it, i mean so there are quite a lot of problematics in how uh, situations are engaging with um, with the the young generation who come who are born after the war. Uh, I I don't have time to talk about this project with uh, this one classic example with Esther Zalamon who was there. Very interesting uh, moment. Esther Zalamon is a Hungarian um, dancer from uh, dance maker uh, from here, and uh, she. What was interesting was that she was not willing to do a workshop on the ground or the floor, but she wanted to talk about her work academically. It was very difficult because we had to translate this to the Cambodians. And how through the, the two weeks of enchantment, in the end, at the end, she gave a physical workshop. She wanted to engage, and she came back. She bounced back, and, and, um, and what's also interesting was that she started to think about her background as a folk dancer, because actually she abandoned folk, folk dancing in Budapest to go to Paris to be a contemporary dancer. So actually her, her background was very similar to the Cambodian dancers who were also working in tradition, and this idea of how do you find an individual individuality in a folk dance or in a in a classical dance from tradition. So the search, so her her search for the for becoming an individual was to move away from tradition, and actually she was completely. That was why I I invited her to come because I felt that she was so relevant to the young dancers there, but she didn't want to to engage in that way. And, and then there was a question of myself as a curator, how did I feel about that? Because I had invited her for, for a very specific reason and she was not interested in going down that road. And, um, and then what happens, right? And so, yeah. So I think that is also that, you know, you can't, you can't direct someone to discover ethical generosity. They have to find it themselves and she did. And, um, but it was, it's an interesting experiment of how you let go, right? How you let go and how the group uh, finds itself, others find themselves in, in a kind of a, a, a network of, of responsibility. Um, so, so in that sense, this idea of, of de where we where I, I, I really see my, my role in, in the last uh, maybe two decades as working with this concept of de ourselves and our arts institutions um, because this is, this is my skill. I'm, I'm an artist, I'm a director. I work with uh, human beings in a situation where we're making work. So this is, this is very important that it, with this skill, I can try to de from within, right? Um, so, so this idea of, of how it, it's also, um, we, we as artists are extremely imperialistic and colonial and how we create those structures as well. And I want to quote Paul Gilroy here because he's a, he's a really interesting, um, uh, African diaspora artist living in London, and he says, um, how do we adopt a more generous and creative view of human beings communicating or acting in concert across racial, ethnic, or civilizational divisions? So this idea of how do we become generous uh, rather than judgmental, I think this is a very strong part of uh, my work with with myself, because how do I also stop judging, right? Um, and this is, this is such a strong part of being a director. You're always judging the work, and you have to take yourself away from that. Um, okay, so, so this, this sense of, um, of, and he talks about, uh, this is a nice quote where he says that we have to, uh, uh, it's about finding an opening for unabashed, unabashed or unashamed humanism that culminates in a new way of being at home in the world, moving beyond national solidarity, national culture, and privileging other more open affiliations. So, um, yeah, I think... Hmm. 
Hello, Marcello. Okay, I think I, I think that this this moment, this last image here that you see is a is is a is an event that we call tea tables, and um, uh, uh, again going back to to Jane Bennett because she says that agency includes making a difference in the world without knowing exactly what you're doing. So you know, very often we 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 feel like we have to this rational uh, Max Weber way, which is that what are you doing? How do you how are you working rationally? But she proposes a way which is irrational, even though you may not know exactly what you're doing, but in the space that you're doing, you're doing something with effect, and you are you are experimenting, which is like theatre people. We know this, right? And performance people, we know that it's always trial and error. Everything that we do is trial and error. We are, we, are, we are going out there and we are just trying, trying an idea and um, without being too rational at the start. And, she's, and she's, she says, that abandon, abandon production, abandon, abandon knowing exactly what you're doing. Um, so this idea of, um, I, I love this title, she calls it uh, The Wonder of Minor Experiences. It's a beautiful title, right? That how, can, how can we be in, in the wondrous minor experiences rather than always being in the, the big moment? Um, uh, and, and um, okay, so enjoying the world. Um, and, and this project was interesting because actually uh, several years later, maybe like five years later, one young Cambodian artist created a work which was very similar to, not similar, but had parallels with, uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, Esther Zalomon's work, where it, the, the Cambodian work was called My Mother and I. It was about all her mothers in her, all the traditional dancers in her. And this work had some, had some parallels with Esther's work called uh, uh, Tanchok, right? Magia Tanchok. I think I'm pronouncing that wrongly, but that's the that's the the the, the title when you read it. It's about her her Hungarian folk dance past and her and her mother because she came from a troupe, a troupe of uh, folk dancers. And then five years later, this young dancer who was in the Cambodian flying circus, she made the piece called My Mother and I. So, you know, it's, it's about how, what remains behind and what actually continues to be there, continues um, without us being very rational about using, about exchanging, about creating something very directly. So, um, now the last part about Myanmar. Yeah, Mi Myanmar was interesting because suddenly as international commun an international artist group that arrived in Myanmar, we were witnesses because whatever we were, we were creating there was every day transformed into a democratic forum for them to talk amongst themselves. So, so it was interesting because like, like the, there would be speakers that we had planned and suddenly it was like boom, boom, boom. We can't even get started in, in the international, local interface. It was all about local, local interface. And it was such a, a joy and also very exciting to, to see that in the end, um, um, uh, we are useless. We are just uh, witnesses to something else that was happening locally. Um, and um, and this, this third form where, in a sense, you know, first of all, we were, we were international in a local site in 2007. In 2010, it was international interfacing with locals through the alternative universities. And then in 2013, we were just bystanders, but very actively hearing and actually asking certain questions of our own practice. But it was this, the, the, the forum was taken over by the Burmese asking questions of each other. So, so um, this idea of the commodity form, again, John Luke Nancy, the commodity form, which is the fetishized form of value, must dissolve itself, sublimate, or destroy itself. In any case, revolutionize itself. And I think this is very, very... Uh, strong for me about about the displacement of production, um, especially where we are always uh, expected to be useful artists, to be useful educationists, to be effective uh, uh, students, effective pedagogies. Uh, what happens when you you 
um, try to displace even that because that becomes the product. Yeah. So what was what made a big change in Myanmar was that. Um, after three years of work there, we invited grassroots public intellectuals. And why, why did this happen? Because it was a kind of a situation where there was no trust in a public space. So any intellectual in the university was compromised, right? That means that they were there because they were part of the military dictatorship. They were all part of the propaganda machinery. And so the locals, uh, in our three years research, were going to grassroots intellectuals. And there were grassroots speakers. And I want to talk in particular about this woman, uh, Ju, um, because she um, actually started an ecological movement. Um, actually, I, 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 I would have loved to have invited her to the Sundowner because she was so, so uh, very, very much on the ground. And, um, and uh, donating her own money. She's a medical doctor and a, and a novelist, but she also was creating a, um, a space for uh, the ecological change in her country. And uh, her name is Ju. So what, what did she actually do? China uh, was, of course, uh, uh, having big impact on its neighbours, and basically China was trying to dam up the main river, the lifeline of Myanmar, the Ayawadi River, China wanted to dam this up to provide electricity for China. And they were, they were basically in a pact with the military dictatorship. Uh, uh, billions were being paid, but billions were going into the pockets of the, of the military generals. And I think that this idea of... Uh, of um, how they made a, a difference through grassroots work. For example, uh, any kind of environmental activism was, was censored. Okay? Th these were the heavy years because the, the years that they were starting to do this was from about 2011 when they were still under heavy censorship. And so they would, they would, do, they would get petitions together, getting uh, public. You know, they, they, they enlisted a lot of journalists, filmmakers, because these were the opinion changes. And they also worked with the local tribes, the ethnic groups, uh, trying to actually uh, talk about what were the ecological problematics on the ground, not just, not just um, uh, um, ecological issues for scholars and for uh, global action groups. But what were happening to minority tribes? Because what was happening was that when China dams the, the, the Ayawadi, all the local ethnic villages were going to be flooded. And they were all being moved out. They were being moved out, but they were being moved from sites of, of, uh, which, were, which were heritage for them for hundreds of years. They've been living there, but they were being moved out so that basically the whole thing would become uh, um, flooded. And, um, and what Ju did was that she held very simple um, workshops for five days over a weekend where she brought scholars and, polit and, and uh, I would say activists, not politicians, because the politicians were all part of the military dictatorship. And she brought also the ethnic grassroots workers, a lot of women, and they, they were involved with um, sharing in the urban city context, in the capital of Myanmar, some of the issues that were going on um, at, at the sites at the local sites. And this was the kind of work that, that we were researching because our, our um, kind of theme that year was about journalism, activism, and also arts. And this theme was, is, is always created from the site itself. And we felt that because journalism was so, was so censored, there was a need to, to, to look at how the media could be activated more in the underground. And also um, this idea of what is actually happening in grassroots activism. So the, the, what, the best thing that we did was to transform the whole thing into, we invited four keynotes 
from the workers and, and the, uh, from the people who are working on the ground. And they are all, they are all like interesting people because they were cartoonists, they were philanthropists. They, a, a lot of them were doctors. They were trying to change like monastery education. They had like very interesting philosophies of small democracies. How do you, how do you uh, create small democracies on the ground? And um, I, I think that this was for me the most exciting thing that we did because we activated the local grassroots public intellectuals and they then brought in all the Burmese who were there and every night it was a discussion between the locals. And I, I found that really um, energizing and I, I was very um, um, privileged, I think, to experience that, that uh, revolution on the side as a kind of a witness. Uh, I think that this 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 idea of um, planetary consciousness is important, and maybe I can just uh, read a little bit here uh, from again from Gilroy because he talks about how we have moved beyond intercultural, transcultural, but to look at the quote the translocal impact of political ideologies, social relations, and technological changes that have fostered a new sense of interdependence, simultaneity, and mutuality, in which, and this part is the, the part is, that's much clearer, in which the strategic economic choices made by one group on our planet may be connected in a complex manner with the lives and hopes and choices of others who are far away. I think that this idea that you are, we are in, in a kind of planetary consciousness that, that I remember listening to BBC uh, during the, the uprising in Cairo and um, some, there was a Burmese listener who got on to the station and uh, she wanted to connect with someone in Cairo who was at the square. And she was talking about, we are trying to organize our democracy movements. And through this radio, which was the BBC, she was in Yangon trying to connect to Cairo. And that was for me, I, I always see this moment as this idea of planetary consciousness. That what's, what's happening in a quite far away place becomes an inspiration somewhere else and becomes a way in which we need to connect. And of course now we, we know that with Greta, and climate change. This planetary consciousness is, is, now, um, is now moving, disseminating, diffusing. Um, okay, maybe, maybe I, I, I think that one of the, the last points is that we realized in Myanmar that we had to make several processes with the public because and this was coming from the local curators and the local artists because they wanted to have um, a public forum where, and it's a strange kind of situation where, the, where as a theater director or an artist, you say, okay, the product is not ready to go out there. It's maybe, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be a real problem. And, um, but the whole idea of that this platform was processed and process needed to be with the public because the democracy had to be with the public and not just a few elite working in this room. So there were, there were, um, uh, um, there were different things like pop-up museums, there was forum theatre, there was a great piece where it was really interesting because we had like a thousand people coming to the, uh, uh, to the Institut Francais because that was the only, only place with political immunity. All these international places had political uh, immunity. So they gave us a field and we invited the Burmese public to come in and nobody could be arrested there. And um, there was a performance about reconciliation where what happened on stage was a kind of a visual installation. There was a visual installation with, um, it was 64 years of of uh, independence after 1948. So there were 64 individuals who were wrapped up and maimed on stage. And then monks came on stage to do a actual public ceremony. Uh, and everybody in the audience started to pray. 
And I found that amazing because there was a kind of a moment where performance and ritual was dissolving. And suddenly the, 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 the performance of the monks on stage, they were making a real ceremony, but everybody started to pray in the audience. And it went into a complete silence. And then after that, the third phase was that uh, there were several activists who came on. Um, there was um, two uh, very strong uh, women activists. One was involved with land grab. And she, she, is a, she was a farmer, but, but she was very involved in teaching law to the local farmers. And the other... Uh, um, Piolette Han was, was a feminist working in, in journalism, and uh, she started a very interesting small project by the idea of carrying whistles to stop sexual harassment on public buses. And, um, and it was, it, the whole project was called Titus Andronicus. It was about violence, right? And the, 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 the activists who were from real life, there was no play on stage, but the activists on real life started to discuss how should we perform Titus Andronicus in a state of violence? Should we have more violence on stage? Should we perpetuate violence? And, uh, and it was interesting to see how the, uh, the activists had very different perspectives. And this was all being discussed live. Of course, it was hard for the international audience, um, uh, the international group. And that's what I meant by we were bystanders witnessing what they were doing. Um, and what was fascinating about the process was that it was a process that needed to be with the public, needed to be with the 700 uh, the, the 1,000 over public members who came to listen that night. I think I, I, think I should stop here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oops, this has a feedback. Thank you so much, King Seng, for this wonderful lecture. Um, we can overlap our time today a little bit. So if there are questions, let's use the moment. I think the, the show, the first ones are going to see will be at 8 o'clock. So um, let's just take, let's say, 20 more minutes or something like this for questions if there are. Of Myanmar, yes. <laughs> so, um, so uh, Cuba will hand you the microphone, and we can do a round of questions. Hi, <laughs> hi, King Sen. Um, thank you so much for for sharing this with us. Um, I'm Corey. I'm from Singapore, so I'm very familiar with King Sen's work, and I've followed Flying Circus Project for for ten years. Um, and and I can't even I can't emphasize enough how much FCP has been such a catalyst for connection within Southeast Asia, um, building different communities. And it's so wonderful to hear from our regional context within this academy that has been incredibly Eurocentric. So I'm really grateful for kind of um, this, this sharing. Um, I guess um, coming from a Singaporean context and also um, um, maybe a Burmese context is my second home through my spouse and I've been visiting Myanmar regularly for, for seven years. Um, I think the FCP, I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking through my thoughts at the moment. Um, Singapore has an interesting relationship with the rest of Southeast Asia. I think it practices often a kind of exceptionalism. Um, it is a very affluent country that tends to fund a lot of projects in other countries. Um, I think you've I mean, done amazingly in kind of avoiding kind of the pitfalls of Singaporean capitalism and commerce. Um, but how do you kind of navigate those, uh, the desires of the Singapore state to present a kind of soft power as it tries to create relationships with other, what it perceives to be um, developing or weaker Southeast Asian states through its money or through its cultural capital. I think it often thinks of diplomacy and cultural diplomacy as soft power in the region. Um, how do you navigate these kind of um, difficulties? Um, and I think also, um, yeah, I think, I'll, and, and oh yeah, and I think, it's amazing to see the kind of transformation that can be done in the rest of Southeast Asia through this project. But I wonder about our home turf of Singapore, where it can be very difficult to navigate, and if you will 
return to that context at some point um, in November 26. <laughs> <laughs> um, in in kind of the kind of difficult contentions we have to face as much as we can connect with other parts of Southeast Asia. Thank you. Um, is this working? Yes, it is, right? Um, I think that um, it's, it's very important. Uh, okay, so I, 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 I'm a failure in some ways because I've insisted on being very pure about uh, the festival, for example. I mean, I, 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 I said that no, I would, uh, this was the, at the very beginning when I, when I found, refounded the festival after 30 over years, I said that I, I, the, uh, I think that we need to change every five years because it's very important to have a dynamism and not to be, um, um, not to stay there and become static because yeah, Singapore International Festival of Arts. So I, I think that, um, uh, and that was a very big national festival. I, I, I had um, maybe 3.5 million euros to work. Um, and uh, I, I suggested that, but of course this became used by the, the right-wing government to keep changing in a way where now it's lost uh, some kind of meaning because now the, the, the present artistic director that's coming in is a very interesting young woman director, but she's very young and she will not be able to really have a resistance. And the one after me was a very commercial Broadway producer. So you can see that in the end, um, actually what I proposed was again appropriated by the right wing to like, okay, let's keep putting in people who actually would not develop any roots. And my, my idea at that time was that we shouldn't be too static because in this government that we see that has been there for 50 years, nobody has changed in 50 years. So, so this, this kind of, um, I, I think the, 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 the feeling that um, I didn't want to compromise that was, a, uh, hello, are you, are you getting me? Okay, uh, I didn't want to compromise that was very important for me. But I can also say that it was a failure because it, or it is a failure because I did not stay uh, to fight and I was ready to uh, to step down. But I think the audience wasn't ready. They needed more time to be in one, to be to find their freedom again uh, after being dictated for so long. And that was the only window that opened because after that they quickly sealed it up because they suddenly knew that if you have an artist so they're committed to having independent artists coming in now but they choose in such a way where it is uh, because we fought for that as an artistic community we fought to change the festival into uh, into independent uh, uh, leadership but it's not really independent anymore it's still being manipulated i feel um so that's a big failure and i think that uh, for me i i feel like um, um but i've come to another feeling actually from these years of um, of looking of running the festival and looking at post festival um that i think that because singapore is a one employer town right it's a, it's an island you, you all won't realize you all won't know how small it is it's 25 kilometers by 40 kilometers it's a diamond shape you take 40 minutes to cross the island in a car, driving at 80 kilometers an hour, and that's it. And then in this, in this there are six million people. Uh, everyone's living high rise. But the interesting thing about, about it is that because it's a one employer town, everybody is linked to the government in some way because they get a tax benefit, they are employed in the university or whatever, uh, they get subsidy, etc., etc. It's impossible to do anything without the government. So now I have a new, I have a new kind of... Uh, a theory about working with the government, which is how, because they, th because our government has been very clever to appropriate the arts, um, and and hence we have to reappropriate them. So we must dance together with them. Every time they, they, they it's like a waltz. You move with me, and I'm, I'll move with you. And you appropriate me, I appropriate you. So I, I think that that's the only way. Because I realized that stepping out was also problematic. And, and you, you, but you can't stay in there because you are compromising yourself. So it must be a, it must be a kind of a conversation of appropriations and reappropriations. You use, you use what I've created. I'm going to use what you are creating, and I'm going to keep uh, destabilizing the situation that way. Um, but you know, you can't, um, you can't step out. 
You know, I mean, like, like I remember when I was in my second year of the running the festival, I said, oh my God, I, I can't, I cannot, I'm so compromised and I feel like, um, and then somebody said to me, I, 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 it's, it's always very funny, they said, okay, you know, in a Chinese uh, marriage, if you are the first wife, you don't step out of the house, don't leave the house. Because if you leave the house, the second wife comes in and the third wife and the fourth wife and you're gone, you're wiped out. So he said, stay, finish it, do it. Be there, and if you stay there and you sit there, the second wife has to talk with you, right? And your husband has to talk to you. So that's how, that's how the, 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 the wisdom of women from, from, from times before, which is that you stay, and you stay, and you claim your space. Because when you leave, you're just going to be forgotten from that family. Right? So, so that's what I did. I, did, I stayed for five years, but I had, I had created a kind of a, you know, I was very involved in reformulating, and I reformulated to give a kind of an openness, which unfortunately has been hijacked, I think, in my view. So, so about this larger question about, about Southeast Asia and the neoliberalism, you know, the leadership, I think that it's... Um, it's it's, it's, it's always there and you have to think of how to work with them, but in a way where you destabilize them and then they, they destabilize you, but you cannot leave. And so this is a, a thing which I, I was a bit too naive to, to feel that, uh, to, to propose a system of transformation, con constant transformation. Yeah, sorry. Um, hi, I'm Hanjin. I'm also from the Young Curators Academy. Um, I could see it a little bit with the different editions which you mentioned, but I was wondering how to not go into with an international group again into a territory and not to reproduce the means of colonialism in a little bit and how to create like a, a meeting space where we're kind of equal or on the same height, and if you found these strategies, I, I heard a little bit, and how do you see it as an extension, because there was a break, as far as I got, with the Young Curators Academy n being made now again. Yeah. I, I, well, okay, so b with the Flying Circus, I think that it's all about putting time and effort and money into the process, because we don't just go in for two weeks, but we actually work for three years in each city, and we try to activate, as I said, to prepare the ground. Um, and that allow, and I also think that it's very important to, uh, to be on that fault line all the time. You know, that means that not to say that, okay, this is, this is colonizing and then we leave that. But I think that we have to keep putting the, and this was the, the, the test of the dehymatizing ourselves, that we have to, uh, we have to be in this conversation because it's too easy to just say that okay, this is now you know this is now the local situation because it's not real because there's a, the local situation is in a global larger context as well, um, and uh, um, I, I think that with the with the with the break, it's because as I said that um, um, the curators academy was I I just feel like we're happening we're having an art scene now where the the artists are, uh, are uh, being funneled in certain, into certain gates. It was less so in the past, I think. There was much more independent work, and the, the independent work had uh, strong resistance. Well, now I feel like institutions, and because of the rise of the art market and the power of these institutions as well, so that now the, the, the dehymatizing has to go to another space, another level. And because I had done the... I had done the um, the, f the, the festival in Singapore, the international festival, I realized that, that all the time as a curator, you're making decisions and choices which affects the race that you see on stage, the gender that you see on stage, the class that you are talk they're talking about, and uh, you know, whether you are a bourgeois festival or you are a, a politically engaged festival, it's the, it's the invisible curator behind that's really creating this in relation to their city. So I, I show this photograph because I think there is a very important moment where there was again another failure happening uh, in, in Myanmar, which was that there, there was so much excitement about their own dem democratization process that when we showed a kind of a parallel context of uh, racism and 
a civil war in Sri Lanka made by uh, a woman, uh, uh, um, a, a filmmaker, Anoma. She went into the, into the enemy camp, she's Singhalese, and she went into the Tamil Tigers camp to look at Tamil Tigers uh, women soldiers who were fighting this, this uh, fighting for the nation. And I mean, and they said some believed in the nation of the Tamil Tigers, some believed, some did, were forced. And it was a very gripping movie of these, I don't know whether there's another image, maybe there's, yeah. You know, uh, she, this, she lost her leg, like, and that's a, that's a, yeah, what do you call it, P prosthetic leg, right? So, um, uh, and what happens now is that after the war, the victors, which is the Singhalese, have actually demolished, they have built over all the cemeteries of the Tamil Tigers. So there's no more, no more grave to mourn at. And I think that it's, it's very interesting how the majority works, the victors work, right? I mean, we, we've seen that also in the, the ex-Yugoslavia, how, how that whole uh, victors and losers in a war, how that works. And I think that, but it was a failure in some levels because the, the Myanmar public was not really interested to discuss this and actually at that time the Rohingya, the Rohingya uh, uh, incidents were already erupting. So, uh, uh, so the whole pursuit of democracy was so important but they did not really perceive a need to look at minorities and to protect the minorities in, in their context as well. And this particular uh, whole series of work, the, because there were several Sri Lankans and, uh, and uh, they were presenting works about their civil war, which of course now we, we see like the, the Rohingya situation has, has become you know, close to a genocide uh, in some ways, yeah. I just wanted to know uh, at what point in your career, um, and also this is based on many years of experience and a certain level of privilege that you do acquire after this level of experience where you, you felt like you could um, uh, apply for funding and get funding for projects and you could allow this space for play. Uh, because if I'm thinking about myself now, uh, I've only been doing my curatorial work for three years now and I feel like uh, you know, I am the first black person to get this project and I feel like I cannot fail because me failing means that they will not work with me and they'll probably not work with any other black woman after this point. So I'm just wondering at what point um, you kind of felt that you had the room to allow uh, this space of um, being yourself and... Um, uh, taking the time with the money that you get from these other institutions to kind of leave that space for the artist or the people that you work with to be um, to be at ease in a way um, and not feel like you have to prove yourself all the time. Because the play means that there is a level of uh, detachment to the expectations because your work speaks for itself um, and not necessarily your color or um, where you come from. I, I suppose it, it's hard to say, but I, I think that I started making, my first professional work was in 1988. And when I started the Flying Circus, initially it was quite tied into a kind of a process to make artwork. And uh, I would say like I started to, to decolonize myself away from the market as another, you know, as a, as a very strong colonial force. And, and by this, I don't mean like the, the colonization as we know, but we are colonized by the market. So I think that about 15 years later after I started, I, I was able to uh, move away. But I think that I was always um, 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 lobbying, gently lobbying and uh, speaking to funding bodies and trying to make them see that their policies had to be changed. And most of them were international agencies. I've, I've worked more on an international level, mainly because I feel like um, uh, the, the nation no longer exists. 
Of course, there is, there is blood money and all these issues, but it's not, uh, not the same, I think, as, as national money. Um, and uh, um, this question of, of uh, going through all, all your journeys, uh, I think you, you, have to, you have to go through it. And every time you, you write a proposal, whether you are African, Asian, white, Latino, there's a strong sense of a fear of failure, right? Where, you know, it's, everything's on the line. So, and I understand that it's more for, because of the, of the, 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 the stakes that are built up, set up against you, so to speak. Um, but I, I think it's, a really, it's really important to, um, uh, to just, to just uh, find your internal balance. That's very important. Because all the time, what you, what you need from the outside is never enough. I want more, I want more, I want more. But you know, I wanted to, you know, to be with chocolate, with icing, whatever I wanted. You know. but, but it's about your internal balance. And um, I, 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 I think that there is a lot of, um, of pain. I think that you know, it, it's important to emphasize that. There's a lot of pain in the, the way that decisions have to be made. Many wrong decisions are made along the way too. Of course, yeah. We went 25 minutes over time. <laughs> so, no, so I think that's also one, uh, a, a good point to finish the night. Thank you so much and thank you to everybody. We will continue our sundowners on Sunday night with Tracy Rose, who's specifically traveling to hear from Johannesburg. So um, I'm so excited for that. And um, see you, son. I mean, the YCS, we see each other tomorrow at 10 and with the others, hopefully, on Sunday night. Thank you so much.